Hi, is my microphone working? Yes, fabulous. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining this session. I'm going to make a plea. There are a lot of people sitting right at the back, and it would be lovely if you would move forward so that we could have a slightly more intimate discussion. So if I could encourage anyone sitting towards the back to come forward so we can see you, you can ask questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, please keep streaming in. That would be fabulous. So I think a few people are, are taking a few minutes to be torn away from their lunch, but we will start uh, nonetheless since there's quite an action-packed program to get through today. So my name's Jessica Espy. Um, I'm a senior advisor to the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which is a global network of academics and knowledge centers around the world, um, trying to work with government at multiple different levels, um, as well as with the UN in New York and UN member states to try and support the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. So it's a real pleasure to be here today to moderate this panel, um, because we have an amazing array of speakers, um, and I think a really interesting topic for discussion. So the Sustainable Development Goals provide a sort of clear mandate to end poverty and a framework with which to do it and to measure it, as we all know. But still the most frequently um, used indicators for poverty have proven insufficient um, to meaningfully drive effective action and, and design pro-poor policies. Uh, prosperity and individual opportunity are still most commonly defined by economic metrics, income, GDP, and so on, as we all know. And better definitions of poverty and more methodologies for measuring it to produce more accurate data and point to actionable policies are available. So this session is going to explore um, some of those methods uh, and some of the new approaches we can use to try and get a better handle on how to design effective policy relevant um, uh, programs to target the poorest and most vulnerable and ensure we don't leave anyone behind. Um, we're going to start with a keynote um, for the Vice Minister of Panama, um, who's going to showcase a little bit uh, some of the work that's been happening in Panama and, and the relevance of the MPI there. And then we're going to go to our, our brilliant panel members. I'm going to quickly run through biographies so that I can then, we can jump through the presentations quite quickly without me having to interrupt. So um, uh, Michelle Machette is the Vice Minister for Social Development of Panama. Um, Michelle is the current Vice Minister um, and also the Technical Coordinator of the Social Cabinet. Um, she has very broad professional experience, ranging from law to cultural affairs to social development. So hopefully she'll bring that diversity of expertise to her discussion today. Uh, then we have Dr. Sabina Alke, who I think many of you know very well. Uh, Sabina directs the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, OFI, which is a research center at the University of Oxford. And her research interests include a wide range of things, um, but particularly multidimensional poverty measurement and analysis, welfare economics, a Martyrson's capability approach, and many other things. Um, then we're joined by Dr. Uh, Shivani Nayar from the Human Development Report Office at UNDP. Um, Shivani is an economist and was formerly a lecturer at Princeton and Vassar Colleges and her main interests include development, microeconomics, behavioral economic, economics, measurement and data. And then finally, um, Lavish Vandari, who's the director of the Ind Indicus Foundation. Did I pronounce that right? Good, just checking. That works on issues of multidimensional inclusion, um, financial, digital and socioeconomic. And Lavisha's work has spanned um, industrial and economic reforms in India, performance of different states across India, socioeconomic conditions and economic geography, and he's also taught economics at the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi and at Boston University. So as you can see, we have a very wide range of expertise uh, and a lot of expertise on this panel, so I hope we'll also get a chance for a rich discussion so we can hear uh, their many different perspectives um, on, on the topics at, question, uh, at debate. So we're going to start with the, um, the Vice Minister, who has generously brought with her today a presentation or a video um, from her colleagues in Panama. So we're going to start with that video to help frame our discussion. Great. Technology permitting, we're going to start with the video. <laughs> Fabulous, thank you. Gracias al equipo técnico que trabajó en esto, gracias a los economistas, gracias a todos ustedes que, que se entregaron en un tiempo récord a hacer esto posible y que Panamá cuente ya hoy con el IPM y con una evaluación clara en los temas de la pobreza. Pero no es mover los números, sino cambiar la vida de las personas que son parte de esos números de pobreza extrema. Después de un gran trabajo técnico liderado por el Ministerio de Economía y Finanzas, el Instituto Nacional de Estadística y Censo y el Ministerio de Desarrollo Social, Panamá 
presentó oficialmente su primer índice de pobreza multidimensional. La nueva herramienta que utilizó la metodología al Foster es un instrumento cuyas dimensiones e indicadores fueron seleccionados y desarrollados con el apoyo de la Universidad de Oxford, cuyos resultados han sido validados por el PNUD y el Banco Mundial. Con una ambiciosa cartera de programas sociales puesto en marcha por varias instituciones del Estado, con el único objetivo de reducir de manera acelerada la pobreza, Ahora nuestro primer IPM nos permitirá focalizar esa ayuda a los sectores que más lo requieran, con el compromiso de efectivamente reducir los niveles de pobreza en todas sus dimensiones y en todo nuestro país. En el Ministerio de Educación trabajamos para mejorar la calidad integral de la educación. Programas como Panamá Bilingüe, Jornada Extendida, los programas de nutrición escolar, entre otros, están orientados a que nuestra juventud vaya mejorando sus condiciones y su desarrollo económico que permitan en los próximos años tener una reducción significativa en el índice de pobreza multidimensional. En el tema precariedad de empleo es cuando el Ministerio de Trabajo y Desarrollo Laboral ha hecho mucho énfasis con sus programas de inserción laboral como lo es el PAI y en su programa Panamá Pro Joven. El MIA como parte del plan Panamá País de Todo Cero Pobreza está impulsando la producción inclusiva en todas las áreas del país, incentivando a ese productor de agricultura familiar a que pase al siguiente nivel de una agricultura comercial. El índice de pobreza multidimensional es un instrumento que refleja el compromiso de Panamá con la transparencia, el uso eficiente de nuestros recursos y la lucha contra la pobreza. En nuestro país, los pueblos indígenas son los que representan mayores índices de pobreza y el IPM nos va a proporcionar información clave para poder destinar políticas públicas eficientes. Estamos avanzando en la dimensión salud en sus tres indicadores, analizando fuentes de agua para mejorar su calidad y que pueda ser bebida por toda nuestra población, control del embarazo y acceso a los servicios de salud, una mejor calidad de vida. El Plan Panamá, el país de todos, cero pobreza, logrará que los valiosos aportes del IPM sean la base para el diseño y seguimiento que sí logren reducir la pobreza multidimensional y lograr que Panamá siga progresando. Buenas tardes a todos. As a representative of the Panamanian government, let me sincerely thank the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development for the kindness of inviting us to share our experience and efforts to leave no one behind in our country. It strengthened my faith in humanity to be here all together, looking for better ways to build a more prosperous, equal, and inclusive world. In this challenge, data plays a crucial role. However, we must always keep in mind that behind figures and numbers, there are human beings who think, feel, and dream. The challenge then is to develop human-centered tools and indicators to capture and transform this reality. Economic growth without investment in human development is unsustainable and unethical. Before sharing with you my experience regarding the MP, MPI in Panama, let me tell you a little bit about Panama. This is Panama, a country of four million people located in the middle of, Ameri of the American continent, home of the Panama Canal, and main commercial route serving the world, with amazingly good economic indicators. But this is also Panama. Despite the fact that poverty and inequality have been progressively reduced, we still have important challenges related to education, health, nutrition, housing, and more. As you all know, in 2015, all the countries that form part of the United Nations agreed on the 2030 Agenda. Its first goal is to eradicate poverty in all its forms and dimensions. To achieve this, it is mandatory to have tools to measure those multiple dimensions of poverty beyond income to ensure that we are not leaving anyone behind. 
This is why that same year we committed as a government to build a multidimensional poverty measure as a complement of income poverty indicators. For those who may not be familiar with the idea of multidimensional poverty, let me give you a very, very quick overview. It is based on the theory of human development and on the capabilities approach of Amartya Sen. And we understand as multidimensional poverty a set of several deprivations in different dimensions of a person's well-being that happen simultaneously. The MPI is a measurement of poverty that focuses on human being and reflects the level of deprivation that affects their well-being. The MPI allows allow us to identify not only how many multidimensional pools that there are, but also why are they poor and how intense are the deprivations that affect their well-being. This is absolutely relevant for policy. Let me now refer to the process we follow in Panama to build our MPI. After adopting the 2030 Agenda and committing to build a national MPI, we as a government decided that being this a multidimensional tool, it should be designed by a multidimensional team. That's why the President set the Social Cabinet as the instance responsible for this task. The Social Cabinet in Panama has an instance, uh, uh, sorry, has a political ministerial level and a technical one. And in addition, we created an advisory committee integrated by the Minister, Ministry of Social Development, the Ministry of Finance, and the National Statistics Institute. We work together with OFI to establish a roadmap of the process following the Alkair Foster methodology. This roadmap was approved by the Social Cabinet and set a one-year deadline to launch the MPI, and so we did. The first step was to define the purpose. This is a crucial step to guide decisions towards dimensions and indicators. The main purpose of the Panamanian MPI is not to measure multidimensional poverty, but to use it as a policy tool to reorient and articulate social policy, taking into account the main deprivations that affect the well-being of people be living in poverty, complementing, not replacing, the poverty income measures. Then, we proceed to choose the level of analysis and data collection. As a difference with other compound indexes, the MPI requires to have a unique source of information. We explored the convenience of using national survey, creating a special survey for the MPI, or using the household survey. Of the three alternatives, the national survey is the one with the richest information and the greater possibilities for disaggregating data, but it is applied every 10 years. And we're talking about a, pool, a tool to reduce poverty. So we, don't have, we couldn't be irresponsible to wait until 10 years, 10 years to assess if our policies are being effective. The idea of designing a specific survey had a great advantage that we could introduce all the questions we needed to identify those deprivations. But beyond the high cost implied by this alternative, we were afraid that this could affect the sustainability of the MPI across governments. Finally, we chose the household survey because of its annual periodicity and because it's trustworthy and representative. The unit of, of analysis is the household. After selecting the source of information, we start a rigorous analysis of the quality of the data it provided and identifying what dimensions and indicators were technically possible. The work was conducted by a technical committee together with academics and poverty experts. We are aware that a high-level governmental position, nor a degree or a PhD, would never let us understand what does it mean to be poor better than people who actually experience it every day. Therefore, we conduct a national-level consultation process to get into account the opinion of the poor in order to have a final proposal of dimensions and indicators to be submitted to the for the approval of the Social Cabinet. And I must say that this consultation changed a lot the, the first proposal that the academics, the experts, and the government officials um, de designed for the MPI. There, there were many, many dimensions that we were not considering, and some others that were relevant for the cities, but not for the rural areas, and vice versa. Afterwards, the National Statistics Institute applied the survey, and the technical committee calculated the MPI. But to avoid political suspicion about the results, we established also an experts board, integrated by the UNDP, the World Bank, and Oxford, to validate the transparency of the process, the data accuracy, and the accurate application of the Alkire Foster methodology. Before launching the results, 
We also organize workshops with the media and forums with governmental institutions, private sector, NGOs, to share with them the insights of the process and the potential value of the MPI, understanding that eradicating poverty is not a task that corresponds only to governments, but it's a task that involves all the sectors of society. Finally, we present the results to the country, being conscious that it was, this was just a first step and that M M an, an MPI by itself won't solve any problem. It depends on the use that we make of it to improve the quality of life of the poor in all its dimensions. I want also to mention that during this process, the multidimensional poverty peer network, integrated by 50 countries all around the world, was extremely important as a source of knowledge and experience from other countries which, which already had an MPI, such as Colombia and Costa Rica. Now, let me share with you what are the dimensions and indicators of the Panamanian MPI. The dimensions are education, housing, basic services and internet access, job, health, environment, surroundings, and sanitation. It's very innovative in the case of Panama, introducing the internet access as a medium to connect with opportunities and also to take in, 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 into account the environmental, in, environmental vulnerability that some of the poor uh, face uh, yearly, uh, depending on the areas where they are established. In the case of Panama, a household or an individual is considered multidimensional poverty when he is pri pri private in five, six or more of the indicators of the multidimensional poverty index. The results of this first MPI was that 19% of the Panamanians live in multidimensional poverty and with an intensity of 43.5%. It means, this means that, on average, people in Panama are deprived in eight or more indicators of the MPI. This information allows us to disaggregate data by territory, as you may see here, and you may see the huge contrast that we face in our countries, having provinces with an MPI lower than 5%, but having the indigenous areas with an MPI higher than 90%. We also can disaggregate data by dimension, by indicators, and this is also by indicator and how they are uh, distributed by province and indigenous regions. Now I want to refer to how are we using it in our country. We are using it to promote and facilitate articulation between the different government institutions by geographic area and needs. And it, it has been very, very useful to bridging the political level and the technical level for the decision making to reduce poverty in Panama. It's also facilitating a better distribution of social programs at the national level in order to fulfill the real needs of the poor. Regarding the monitoring, we are right now working into aligning all the goals of the different institutions of the government using the indicators of the MPI as a criteria to then be able to uh, articulate also the way we assign the um, social budget in Panama using the MPI as a criteria. Finally, conscious of the relevance of childhood poverty and the specificity of the deprivations that affect this age group, we recognize that this national MPI helped us to take better decisions, but we needed something deeper and focused on that specific deprivations of, child, of children. And that's why we're working together with Oxford and UNICEF to build the first uh, children MPI in our region. But it's not only inside the government that the MPI is being an important tool for articulation. Right now we are working uh, and finishing a pilot and a case study at a community level where five NGOs ask 
for our guidance and support to build a local MPI to identify the main deprivations in order to articulate their, effort, their efforts and interventions and to monitor their progress at the level community. So this is something very innovative that is currently in progress, but I'll be happy to share with you as soon as we finish. They are, right now, they came back from Colombia from a workshop where they were estimating that local MPI and the next month they're going to articulate the action of these different NGOs in the territory. So I think this is very important because it shows the potential of this tool, not just for governments, but for different sectors of society to make better decisions and to effectively address the real needs of the people we are uh, called to, to serve. To conclude this quick introduction to many, many, many subjects that I would love to have the chance to discuss with you, I want to conclude with three main ideas that I want to leave you. First, that the MPI is not just an alternate indicator to measure poverty. It is a tool for policy, an inter- and multi-sectoral articulation. Second, that the MPI is an indispensable tool to track progress towards SDG 1, but also to facilitate integration with other SDGs, such as zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, clean water and sanitation, decent work, strong institutions, partnerships, and more. And finally, always keep in mind that data is valuable only if it's used to effectively solve problems. Therefore, it is critical to bridge between the technical and the political, between indicators and people's life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. That was a, a brilliant presentation and a fascinating overview of everything Panama's been able to achieve, and in such a rapid period of time, so incredibly impressive. Um, we now get to hear from um, Sabina, who is kind of one of the world leader on the multidimensional poverty index, so um, she can lend some more uh, reflections on the replicability of this method in other countries around the world. Thank, Thank you. you so much, and I'm grateful to the Global Partnership on Sustainable Development, to Jessica, Spi, Malika, and the others who organized it, but I'm really grateful to you for being here. And what I'd like to do in the time allotted is to sort of underscore some of the lessons Michelle has shared and ask you for input in how to communicate, if you're a communicator, in how to link, if you can link us to other groups, but in how to use this uh, tool of a multidimensional poverty index in the context in which you work. So um, the framework is, of this session is going beyond GDP. And GDP is a number for a country that reflects a monetary achievement, um, but not the distribution of that achievement. And a monetary poverty measure reflects the proportion of the population or the degree to which that population are below some cutoff. And they're both very important measures that have to continue. Um, but what a multidimensional poverty index adds to those is, first of all, it's composed very explicitly of direct deprivations in health, education, employment, housing, um, and other dimensions. So it is itself multidimensional, just like the SDGs are moving towards an explicitly multidimensional framework with the economic, social, and environmental. Instead of just having a national aggregate, and I love and am a fan completely of the human development family of indicators, um, but they are based on a dashboard, or the SDG indicators are a dashboard of national aggregates. But the MPI, as we'll show you, is built up of individual poverty profiles for each person, um, which is why it has some of these characteristics. And so as a result of these two, rather than looking at one indicator at a time, monetary poverty, education, it's a many at a time kind of tool. And so although we'll be describing it about poverty, it could be applied to time use, it could be applied to multidimensionality of health, or multidimensionality of work as the Inter-American Bank have done. So very briefly, um, just to reiterate, who says poverty is multidimensional? The most important for us are the poor men and women in communities. And as Michelle said, the consultations form the backbone of all work on poverty because they are the real experts and not us. Um, but clearly within the Transforming Our World document, poverty in all its forms and dimensions is reiterated as the, as the, the understanding of poverty that now we have. And also institutions like the World Bank have come around to thinking that when we track global poverty, 
we need both monetary measures and non-monetary, including a multidimension poverty indicator. So now just two minutes on what is an MPI. Um, and as I said, the key factor is that for each person, you are going to take some dimensions and indicators and look at their lives and see what they in particular as individuals or as families, households are experiencing. And so we're going to be based on each, each person's inputs and then based on their pro portfolio of deprivations, we'll identify a deprivation score, see whether or not they are poor, that is whether they have enough deprivations at the same time to merit policy support and then compute measures. So just to give you an example, um, this is a global multidimensional poverty measure. Um, and the question that we have is Miriam. Is Miriam deprived, is Miriam poor according to the 10 indicators in that as a person? And she might be deprived because she is malnourished, deprived because she has not a com com completed five years of schooling, deprived because she lacks improved sanitation, adequate water, electricity, and enough assets. So each of, of the deprivations comes from a person. And then we wait and see if they are identified as poor and make an index which has fancy axiomatic properties which really are not as relevant to uh, a data and policy discussion but perhaps um, are important because it then can be unpacked in the ways that are useful for policy. Um, and there's academic stuff about that if you'd like. But here are the ideas I wanted your help in understanding, communicating, challenging. One is that the indicator of a multidimensional poverty measure, as Michelle said, takes some of the indicators of the SDG and brings them together. Um, and so it, it links the indicators of the MPI with the Sustainable Development Goal. And so one of the observations of the SDGs is that these goals are interlinked. But this seats those interlinkages into the lives of poor people, men, women, and Nahato from Uganda, uh, a child of, of two years. It doesn't cover all the SDG indicators or everything that's relevant, but some important parts. A second is that we talk about being left behind, but some people are left behind in a lot of things at the same time. And no other SDG indicator says who's left behind in five, six, ten indicators at the same time. So an MPI technically looks at the joint distribution of deprivations, but it has that, that, that ability to focus on some of the poverty indicators that are a priority and look across them to really identify the poorest of the poor. And um, the third is that we hope that by having, we have a dashboard for the SDGs with many indicators, but by having a collection of these under a single headline, that that will, in a sense, incite action, compassion, solidarity, and the different things that are needed to unlock um, the, the poverty traps. So, um, as Miguel Tsekeli said in a book, Numbers That Move the World, um, and as Michelle said so often, that our aim in doing a measure is really to awaken consciences, to mobilize the reluctant, to ignite action, and to generate debate and discussion and disagreement, but also hopefully lead to resolving um, some of these deprivations. So that's the, the headgear. And then in the last few minutes, I just wanted to give you an idea of um, the community that Michelle represents that are part of a network of many countries working on multidimensional poverty indicators in order to link with the sustainable development goals. So um, many governments have official national MPIs that are released either annually like Panama, Ecuador, uh, Colombia, El Salvador, or are released um, every two years as in Mexico and Chile and Pakistan or every five years as in Bhutan. And they reflect national priorities, a law, a national development plan, a participatory process, um, uh, the data set that must be used. Um, and sorry, the slides are not formatted. 
correctly. But the important thing is that they are being used to drive different policies of targeting, of budget allocation, of coordination or articulation across different sectors. And I think the political economy of this is that if you have one goal that you're going for, together with your sister in the Ministry of Health or somebody else in the Ministry of Transport, Education, Water, Women and Children, and you're trying to move the dial on the one goal, then you work together. And if you're trying to move your indicator and they're trying to move their indicator, then you might be competing. So there may be an interesting thing, we, we're geeks, we haven't studied this, we need your input to understand it more, but there might be some value in having a headline indicator for poverty that supports and incentivizes coordination. And then there's also the global MPI, Multidimensional Poverty Index, which um, we will hear about in a moment, which OFI have had the honor and privilege to estimate with the Human Development Report Index. And unlike national MPIs, but like the $1.90 a day measure, this can be compared across countries. So the question for you in this room is, is this useful to you when we talk about disaggregated data as we did this morning? So it's disaggregated by lots of subnational units. For every country, we have the disaggregation for children. And very sadly, nearly half of the world's poor are children across 5.5 billion people and 104 countries. We can also disaggregate by subnational units, nearly a thousand of them. We'll break a thousand uh, this next update. And we can see, as Michelle did, not only these subnational regions, the level, but also the composition of poverty by indicator. And then looking across time, we see how it changes. And so that's a measure perhaps more useful for international agencies, for activists, for students, and for NGOs that are trying to position themselves across country borders. So really, this is a work in progress, and like many works in progress, that means there's really a chance for breakthrough, for innovation, for new ideas and tools, and we're really looking to partner and work with people who can do data visualization, who can do more on the politics, more on coordination, or link this work with others. Um, but we very much are grateful for this opportunity to think both about poverty and its content, and also about metrics that can be used in poverty or in health or in gross national happiness, as in the case in Bhutan, but that really give the multidimensional approach of the SDGs seriousness and rigor, as well as a deference to the experts in that topic area. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sabina. That was a, a fabulous overview, and I know you did it in lightning speed, given the density of material there was to get through there and how rigorous the MPI um, process has been to come up with the methodology. We're gonna, I, I was particularly inspired by the, the quote you put up about a number should awake consciousnesses or conscience. And, um, and I think it's really interesting to hear now from um, Dr. Shivani Nayar about the work that the UN is doing, specifically UNDP, to use the MPI um, to try and catalyze member states um, and governments around the world to really focus on ensuring no one is left behind and multidimensional poverty. Great. Thank you, Jessica. Um, Sabina is a tough act to follow, but I'm going to try. Uh, so my presentation is going to step back a little bit and um, be on maybe not such a specific level. Let's begin with this quotation that I really like from John F. Kennedy, which was about 50 years ago. Um, and he says, for too much, uh, too much and too long, we seem to have surrendered community excellence and community values in the mere accumulation of material things. Our gross national product ca counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear out highways of carnage. Yet, the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. So the point is that GDP, which is a measure of goods and services produced in the economy, or you can say a measure of income, it leaves out a lot of things that you and I value in our daily lives, and we have reason to value. So that's where the human development approach uh, based on the capabilities approach from Amartya Sen comes in. And the human development and capabilities approach, which is a people-centered approach, basically argues that um, 
that whether you look at the development of a country or you look at the deprivation or the poverty of its people, you have to look beyond GDP, beyond just an income dimension. And what are, you have to, you have to look at things that people care about. So these could be things like uh, having a good education, having knowledge, having a long and healthy life, and of course, having a, a sufficient uh, income and a decent uh, standard of living are important. And there are other dimensions beyond these which are very important. It could matter to you to be an active citizen in your society, to have a voice, to participate in discussions. It could matter to you that you and your fellow citizens have human rights, they have human security, uh, the state of the environment, environmental degradation, climate change. So uh, this is what the human development approach uh, captures. Now the human development index is a measure of the progress of a nation. And I know this has been said many times, but the idea is to go beyond just looking at the income dimension. So it takes into account uh, the health, the education, and the income dimensions. Um, Sabina just spoke about uh, the multidimensional poverty index. Now, the, the human development index is a measure of progress, and the multidimensional poverty index is a measure of deprivation or poverty. And just, uh, just like the human development index, it goes beyond the income dimension. And it actually reflects the same three dimensions broadly that are captured by the HDI. So we have the health dimension, the education dimension, and the living standards dimension. And I won't go into the details of the index because you just did. Um, so uh, the MPI was created uh, jointly by OFI and uh, our office, the Human Development Report Office, and published for the first time in the Human Development Report 2010, which was the 20th anniversary report, um, because these reports started in 1990. Um, the Human Development Report Office continues to calculate a global MPI, which is published in each report. And uh, this is the one that Sabina was talking about, the one that you can compare across countries and across time. And so in the last report, uh, we published the MPI for 102 countries. Uh, in the analysis in the report, uh, we also you know, disaggregate uh, the MPI as needed by subnational region, urban and rural dimensions, or for gender. And over the years, the, the methodology used by OFI and the one used by our office, these have uh, evolved separately a little bit. They, they differ a little bit in the details, not in the overall framework. Uh, but um, uh, recently, uh, we have reached an agreement with OFI that we are going to align the two methodologies and uh, so that they are in full agreement. And then going forward, uh, the next generation of human development reports is going to publish the MPI based on the new methodology. So, so we, we publish uh, the global human development report, but there are also many other human development reports informed by this approach to go beyond GDP, beyond income. And these are published either at the regional levels or by national um, national teams. So, so far there have been 25 global human development reports, over 40 regional human development reports, and 720 national uh, human development reports. And um, all these reports uh, bring important issues that are uh, important at the regional and the national levels. They bring them to the discussion. And uh, they also do a lot of innovation uh, in terms of measurement indices and um, other things. And I'm going to skip over the rest of this slide. So basically, uh, the human development approach, uh, we see it um, as complementing the SDGs. And uh, I'm just going to, so there is a lot of overlap between the data that uh, we report and the indices that we calculate and the SDG indicators. Um, not going into the details again, but basically, I just want to uh, conclude and say that um, a lot of work has been done and the conversation has moved beyond GDP. Uh, and this, this is quite evident in the SDGs itself. But a lot of work remains to be done, whether you look at the global level or the national level. 
or you look at aggregate indices or um, you know at uh, different indicators lack of indicators to measure different dimensions and looking forward we hope to keep pushing for this work thank you Thank you so much, Shivani. I think you really helped elaborate the fact that there are a, a broad suite of tools that are becoming increasingly available for countries to be able to uh, design more pro-poor and targeted policies and look at um, the many different dimensions associated with deprivation um, and, and the experience of poverty. So now, um, zooming in a bit more, we're going to turn to Eleanor, who's with Data2Wax, and she's going to um, elaborate a little bit more one particular approach to looking at a form of deprivation and, and human experience, and that's looking at the methodology it's time use surveys. Right. Oh. Oh. We seem to be missing her presentation. Do we have? <laughs> Apologies. Okay, maybe we'll just check what's going on there. Eleanor, would I can make a start. Do you mind happy to start? Fabulous. No problem. Um, great. Well, good afternoon. Um, and as, as Jess said, my name is Eleanor Carey. I'm the technical manager for Data2x. And for anyone who's not familiar with our work, um, we're a technical and advocacy platform. And we are really dedicated to improving the quality and availability um, and use of gender data in order to really make a practical difference in the lives of women and girls worldwide. Great. So we have slides now. So, um, two weeks ago, Data2x published a report um, really focusing on time use surveys as a, uh, a, a measure that is important um, to collect data on women and girls. And if anyone is interested uh, in, in looking at the report in more depth, my colleague Rachel has some materials you can see her afterwards. Um, and this report really takes a deep dive look both at how uh, at methodological questions surrounding time use surveys, but also the range of policy impact. Um, that surveys have had in 18 countries um, that we did case studies on across the globe. And in the next few minutes, I'll give a, a brief overview of the gaps that are left by traditional economic um, data that time use surveys can really help to fill. And I'll then take you through just one country case study um, looking at uh, Colombia. And I think we, we might have some colleagues from, from Danny in the room so they can uh, um, uh, chip in later if they wish. So for anyone not familiar with time use surveys, these are instruments that collect data on how individuals spend their time over a specific period, um, most commonly 24 hours. And the data derived from time use surveys um, really fills key gaps in knowledge about economic activity, prosperity and well-being, giving us insight into ways that individuals spend their time. And one of the most unique contributions that time use surveys uh, make is information on unpaid work. And these are the hours that are spent on taking care of others, um, doing activities in the community, and also productive activities. So, for example, working on a family farm. This type um, of work is traditionally done by women and is critical to the functioning and well being of societies. But policymakers have historically overlooked this kind of work, and it's largely gone unmeasured in official data. However, change is afoot. In 2013, labor statisticians agreed internationally to begin measuring all types of work, both paid and unpaid. And the Sustainable Development Goals, um, as, as we've been talking about today, also underscore the need to collect sex disaggregated data on this type of work. Essentially then, is that the definition of employment has really narrowed to work which is only for pay or profit. The definition of work itself has broadened to include all productive activities, including unpaid household work, um, as well as care work, although this work remains outside the system of national accounts. So work is now defined irrespective of its formal or informal character, the legality of the activity, and importantly, productive work can be performed in any kind of economic unit, including the family or the household. The predominance of unpaid family workers and casual, temporary, or seasonal labor in, for example, agriculture and small informal enterprises in lower income contexts tends to lead to under, under, excuse me, underestimation of work hours and employment figures, especially for women and children. And this underestimation arises because surveys such as censuses, <coughs> censuses and, tip, and uh, household surveys typically classify workers according to their reported main occupation, um, often resulting in women self-reporting as housewives and not in the labor force at all, and therefore they're not being captured. Some 
Um, <clears throat> the expansion of the service sector and the growth of jobs using mobile technologies have also led to more flexible and atypical work schedules and workplaces. And time use data has been shown to more effectively capture the actual level of market hours when compared with usual labour force survey data. But time use data also reveal that time spent on unpaid housework, care of children, of elderly persons, disabled and ill members of the household and community, and on voluntary community-oriented work is generally missed by labour force or household surveys, and thus not included in national accounts. <clears throat> A 2012 World Bank study, for example, found that irrespective of countries' per capita income or degree of development, women bore the disproportionate burden of responsibility uh, for housework and other care work. And this was found to be an important factor in um, therefore driving labour market segregation and the consequent earning, earnings gaps. In addition, it meant that most women across all societies worked longer hours than men, whether or not they were recognised for it. And uh, just as a, an added uh, cherry on the cake, these patterns were found to be greatly accentuated for women after marriage and childbirth. Despite a number of methodological challenges that still exist with time use, and happy to discuss it in more detail um, during our discussion, across the 18 country case studies that we looked at in Data2x, we were able to see a range of policy impact that time use um, data has had. And this demonstrates the unique contribution of this type of information. Each country was examined under the same framework, which you can um, see behind me here, which identifies the factors um, that influence the data to policy link. And these include the political environment, stakeholders, and policy design and implementation capacity. And all of these then sit within an overarching local context, which really mediate how um, effective this data can be. Um, I'm actually just going to skip over this slide um, because I want to have enough time to, to talk about a case study um, and in particular one of the, the most um, direct policy impacts that we saw across the case, study, case studies was in Colombia. Um, and they've seen very direct links between their time use data and policy development where the data was actually used as a basis for um, a law on the caring economy. And the law in turn itself um, caused for um, increased collection of time use data. The main objective of the law being, and this is um, uh, quoting directly from it, to include the caring economy composed of unpaid work in the national system of accounts in order to measure women's contribution to the economic and social development of the country and to serve as a key tool for the, <clears throat> for the definition and implementation of public policies." Unquote. So there's a very clear and direct link um, being drawn there. While the original focus of the law, um, however, was really to create um, an unpaid work satellite account, however, the strong political backing and creation of a, a multi-sectoral working group of members of government and civil society has helped to focus on the satellite count as really um, a, a first measure rather than an endpoint um, in the process of developing public policy around care. Um, DANE, the National Statistic Statistical Authority in Colombia, has been collecting some form of time use data since 2007 and conducted their first time use survey excuse me, their first standalone time use survey in 2012, 2013, and a second in 2017. And from this, they were able to produce an unpaid work satellite account and an annual women and men in Colombia report. The main user of the data is the Caring Economy Committee uh, chaired by the Presidential Advisor on Gender Equality. So I think you can see that there's um, very uh, Im important factors that, that go into making this data um, helpful, such as the stakeholders who are um, involve, involved. And I think the findings of the surveys, uh, this survey really underlines the crucial information that's often missed through other collection exercises. So for example, um, caregiving activities account for 19% of the country's GDP. And just to give you a flavor, that's actually more than agriculture, more than industry, or more than the financial sector taken each individually. 69% of women spend time doing unpaid work in the household compared with 33% of men and women spend more time on average than men. 79% of the hours spent on unpaid work and care work is done by women, and importantly, nine in 10 women do work or activities that are outside the scope of the national system of accounts compared with six in 10 men. So that just illustrates that if we are only interested in uh, what is captured in the system of national accounts, we're going to miss a lot of what women are doing. 
Uh, this time use data has directly helped to shape the discussion about the national care system and indirectly the data has influenced the national public policy on gender equity which utilizes the unpaid work satellite account to highlight gender inequalities. It's also indirectly um, uh, been influential in discussions around Colombia's national development plan. So the case of Colombia, I think, is a prime example of the nuanced information that can be gleaned from time use surveys and the different questions it allows us to ask and answer about women's and men's lives. While traditional economic metrics occlude much of women's work, we're hopeful that time use surveys can lead to better policies that recognize the true and disproportionate work burden that women of the world are currently bearing. Thank you so much, Eleanor. That was a, a great presentation. And also, um, you raised some really interesting points about how you link this evidence to policy and the policy impact, which I hope we'll come back to in the discussion. So our final speaker is um, Lavish. And I think one of the things we're going to hear from Lavish, which is great, is a link back to the presentation at the beginning about Panama's experience and the importance of that spatial dimension and using this evidence to shed light on spatial uh, distribution of poverty. So, Lavish, to you. thank you. So, thank you. Thank you for being here. And uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, so I had a 15-minute presentation, uh, which has been now cut down to eight minutes, so I'll use every alternate slide. Um, uh, so, so this is essentially about many dimensions of poverty. I sometimes do believe that poverty is a much misused uh, term, and essentially because uh, I think the economists got to that concept before the psychologists or the sociologists and so on. Uh, so essentially, we tend to think of poverty as a lack of consumption. So obviously, I think it's more about a certain degree of endemic helplessness. Uh, but anyway, we, won't, we don't need to get into the concepts as much as the dimensions that I like to think about a bit more than the usual, and which uh, essentially is social, time, digital, and spatial. I will not really talk too much about the social and, and, and time aspects, but, but, but spend a few uh, minutes both on the digital and spatial. The idea that I uh, want to share, or the ideas that I want to share with you, is not so much about the concept of poverty, of what really, how do you get digitally excluded or uh, spatially excluded and so on, but essentially more about the implementation of it. What does a policymaker do? What does a researcher who needs data uh, for, 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 for identifying some of these exclusions do. So that's what I'm going to try and spend a bit uh, more time on. So, um, uh, multiple dimensions confuse policymakers. Uh, this has, at least in my experience, been one of the most uh, the critical problems whenever I have tried to interact with the government or, or some government uh, uh, institutions, uh, policymakers, politicians, and so on. Essentially, they get, you know, just give us a single number. Uh, it's, it's too complicated. We, as it is, cannot handle uh, economic poverty, and you're asking us to talk about temporal or, uh, or spatial poverty or digital and so on. Uh, the problem, essentially, is not so much about, the way I feel, is not so much about that you have too many dimensions, and then for each dimension you need a specific policy measure. But essentially the problem is that a failure to understand that each, just studying each dimension gives you a completely new way of thinking about that endemic helplessness is, uh, uh, that, that I was mentioning. So essentially, um, there's this picture, it's a fairly standard picture. It's apparent it's from South Asia. Um, now, I'll, I'll just use the Indian context uh, uh, that, uh, to, to, to try and understand this picture. Now, in India, for many, many decades, uh, we measured poverty as a combination, as derived from a combination of uh, not having enough calories and not having enough clothes. Uh, this gentleman out here probably is not calorie deprived and does appear to be not too uh, deprived of clothing either. So essentially, by the standard measure of poverty, this person would probably get past the, uh, the, this thing. Uh, there are certain social inclusion that we tend to look at. Uh, India started capturing caste long, long time in the past, and that seems to, and we messed up a lot in that process, but that's, that's another story. But however, we do not capture a whole range of other social exclusions. Um, I will again not get into it, except just to find two, which I think we need to start to think of more and more, and that essentially is long-term ailments, uh, HIV, for instance, or um, um, intoxicants or addictions and so on. 
Uh, time use I will not mention. I mean, there's already been a great discussion before that. But I, as I said, will talk about digitally and spatial poverty. Now, this particular gentleman out here, uh, the interesting part from this particular picture is that he is cleaning his house, uh, which is interesting because in South Asia, you would normally expect that to be a woman. Uh, so there she's probably at work, which also gives you some indication that she may be really time deprived. Uh, there's also uh, an adolescent at the back, so he's essentially not going to schools. There is an educational deprivation which is out here. There is no wire or a digital, uh, any, any indication of digital use. So this person is also digitally deprived, uh, and so on and so forth. So essentially, just deprivation in itself has obviously many dimensions, and I like to think, uh, I like to work on things that, that typically uh, people uh, don't look at in India, at least. So essentially the problem of digital exclusion uh, is that uh, it's great. I mean, if I had power to get digital data, I could tell a lot about all other forms of exclusion, especially in a society which is now increasingly on the mobile all the time. Uh, except that I have a problem, and the problem is that though I could measure digital exclusion in many different ways, I don't get that data. And why don't I get that data? Because I have privacy laws overseen by a judiciary, a very activist judiciary. I have a financial regulator, which is overseeing all the financial transactions that are happening in the digital space, and I have a telecom regulator. And between the three of them, and, and then there's a fourth entity, which is the state, it's, it's very, very difficult to get data, uh, at the, uh, digital data. Uh, if I could, then uh, I could tell a lot about, as I've already mentioned, uh, not just about the various elements of, uh, of, of deprivation, but I could also guide policymakers on how to go about in their intervention. Uh, now, how do, how do I uh, go about it? And essentially, I'll just, this is a very stylized diagram of, of, uh, of, uh, of digital, uh, this thing, it could be used in the financial domain as well. We have many users. There's been a lot of discussion of how usage data of the digital space can, can yield a lot of insights. There are, of course, privacy concerns there. Except that as a researcher, if I was to get access to this data, it would make my life very difficult because there are too many gaps in this data. Only very few people share their data with you. And the, the, the possibilities of leaving out some important things get messed up. I could take the data from the service provider the problem with the service provider is there are competitive issues and they are typically very, very reluctant to share that data. So uh, what we are trying to work at uh, is to come to go to the regulator and ask the regulator to demand the right kind of data from the service providers. And the major advantage with the digital space is that uh, the regulator can have access to just about all the data. And uh, maybe, perhaps, be better, uh, uh, better at uh, making it more hygienic in terms of privacy issues. Now, uh, India is very lucky in, in a sense that we have a huge biometric uh, uh, um, program, uh, biometric identification program. Uh, we have linked our mobile phones with the biometric identification with the bank accounts. Uh, we have linked the bank accounts uh, with, with all three. So everything is really linked to each other. So you could potentially get access to a whole lot of data. Uh, we also have amongst the highest uh, usage in both, amongst the underprivileged of the mobile or the smartphone. Now, I can imagine that all of you, and I included, would, uh, would, would, would wonder about all the privacy elements there. But setting them aside, there's a lot of power in that data. In a country where the person is unable to get access to a whole lot of services, having just access to this data of both behavior as well as uh, this thing of financial and digital data can be a very powerful tool. Except that right now, the government does not do any of this, uh, the, and, and the whole ecosystem is not really evolved for it. So in an ideal world, what would you do? In an ideal world, what I would like to believe is that you have the state itself or the government itself get the data from the various players, use the privacy hygiene, and then share it with researchers uh, for, for, for various elements. There is another element out here uh, that I think is very important. The power of, uh, of some of this comes from not the aggregate, but also the relationships at the disaggregated level. And that's essentially what we are trying to get to. Uh, the second part that I'd like to spend a few minutes on is that of spatial. 
Now, it's very simple. The poor do use less space to live, work, and travel. Uh, and what we find is that typically in uh, poor areas have less density of transport infrastructure. They live in some smaller poor quality housing. They have less, uh, they also tend to live, uh, have, have uh, lean less space for, uh, for uh, work and also travel less distance. Uh, it's the, some of the work that I and my colleagues did, we found that the correlations between what we term as spatial poverty and uh, economic poverty can be 80 to 95%. And this is for the work that we had done uh, over, over a space of three years. So, um, so what is spatial poverty? The way I like to think about it is that spatial poverty is about living quarters which are not, which are cramped, of not good enough quality, uh, which is a surrounding which is not really planned. You don't have access to public spaces. You don't have access to greenery or playgrounds. Uh, there's infrastructure. There's a lack of uh, decent infrastructure in your vicinity, obviously power, roads, and so on, and also accessibility to important centers for uh, either income or consumption. Now, the beauty of spatial poverty is that you need not really collect data in the conventional sense, and you can use a whole lot of imagery which is publicly available. Um, and you don't need to go to a government for any of this data. It's there. Some of it is free, uh, but processing it is very expensive. So. Uh, Today, uh, you have very granular satellite imagery, and I know because I used it, uh, where you can get down to, where you can use it for, I mean, night lights data is very well talked about. There is built up area which you can very easily estimate from satellites. Uh, you can very easily get the presence of water bodies. You can have out open and green spaces. Uh, satellite imagery is also being used increasingly to measure the quality and the uh, length and the width of roads, uh, lights, crossroads, uh, and so on. At the same time, you have all of these GIS services, which are providing you data on points of interest, schools, hospitals, uh, markets, and commercial areas. So if you put all of this together, this data can very easily help you estimate a, 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 a notion of what we uh, term as spatial poverty. Now, having said that, uh, this, is a, this is a picture, obviously, of India, uh, where uh, these, these colors are essentially at one pixel is one square kilometer. This is a poverty estimate that was done uh, on, on Indian poverty uh, and this thing. And we got some really interesting insights. These kind of insights, typically in the economics literature, I had not, uh, I had not seen. The first interesting one was uh, that the urban poor especially tended to be close to surface water uh, and reason, where, where, where there was surface water available. And the, obviously the answer was that the urban poor don't have access to piped water. So it's best to be in a place where you have service water. Uh, this tended to be in many cities on river floodplains. So they were even more likely to be affected by rains and so on. Uh, then there are some, another interesting thing is that uh, uh, you have poverty tends to be near mining areas. You tend to see more and more of it next to, uh, uh, next to forests or barren lands and so on. At the same time, if you just study where the pockets of poverty are, we found that they were far, or it was difficult to access basic urban infrastructure or basic social infrastructure. It was difficult to access uh, good roads. And strangely, we found that tourist locations had very less poverty, and probably that was because the government must be cleaning it up. Uh, but uh, that's some of the kind of insights, and, I've, and, and Jessica said, you're done. So which gets me to my final presentation. Uh, I'm wrong on the first point. What is not measured does not generally improve. Uh, we must look at various dimensions. I have just talked about two. Uh, I do believe that each dimension tells us something more uh, for, for, for policy action. Uh, it is also true that most dimensions are highly correlated with each other, except that, and I think the MPI group has already found that, 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 that at the very micro level they need not be. And last, not the, this thing, methods of integrating are the critical part. That's what's uh, most important here. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Lavish. Um, I think that was, again, a really great contribution because we've heard about specific methods, methods for estimating particular deprivations, but you also alluded to the fact that there is a really strong correlation between one form of deprivation and many others so that you can infer multiple deprivations from some forms of measurement, which I think is great. I'm going to abuse my position of chair to just pepper a couple of questions at the panel, and then we're going to open it up because we want to hear from everyone here. So I wanted to start... Um, 
uh, with the basic point that's come up a few times um, and asked the, the minister particularly this question, which is we've heard about a, a wealth of really interesting evidence and information um, and, and more and more data being collated every day. But how do we get this evidence into the hands of policymakers? Uh, there was a great example from Colombia of the law, um, you know, that's been very useful to get time use surveys being used more often. But in Panama, what's the experience that you've had of how do you make sure that different departments, ministries, the executive is using the MPI or any other data for their sort of daily decision making? Yes. In, in our case, getting decision makers thinking multidimensionally has been a key. Um, using the social cabinet as a space, not just to discuss policy, but to create policy from this point and, and in advance with a multi-dimensional approach is the way uh, is, is working for us. And having a strong link between decision makers and the technical tier of government and the policy makers, having this continuous discussion, but always from this multidimensional uh, perspective. And I can put some examples. We, after launching the MPI, we designed a specific strategy, and it's a policy strategy, to reduce extreme poverty in the, uh, those territory, territories that usually were left behind, like to reduce that gap. And the design of this strategy was eminently multidimensional. And the, the points that the different ministers set into, put into the table were not directly the, the areas of their own work. We had an, a Ministry of Environment uh, caring about educational issues, or an agricultural mi minister caring about health issues. So I think the main thing before, uh, be, uh, behind this is to get this mindset of thinking multidimensionally, and then to assess policy on that way and to analyze policy on that way. And on the last session of the social cabinet, one of the minister proposed that all the social policies that we develop all the bids, all the uh, regulatory matters and issues uh, regarding the social should come through the social cabinet to have this multidimensional contribution from the different ministers before going to the National Assembly, for instance. So I think, and that's why I, I wanted to stress of the value, about the value of the MPI, not just as a measurement, but, but as an effective tool for articulation and to change the mindset in order to think in a different way and to develop policies and analyze policies in a whole different way. Fabulous, thank you. That's a brilliant example. And I think we're talking so then about behavior change, institutional sort of shift in the way we think about how we structure interventions and sectoral um, policy design and so on. This is a bit of a, a jump, but again, you raised the point about uh, targeted sort of um, regional uh, strategies based on the MPI. So I wanted to quickly come to Lavish um, and just say, Lavish, you were also talking about the importance of taking into account the spatial element um, and being able to look at all these different dimensions, uh, you know, across, across uh, different levels of government and administrations of the country. How important do you think it is that all of this data, that all of this, um, uh, all these deprivation measures are being also geo-referenced, that we're thinking about actual location of all the individuals who are experiencing these different things, and that we have, and that governments have access to satellite imagery, uh, you know, and have the ability to geo-reference things so that they can design spatially relevant strategies. I think obviously that it's critical, and I think for a, for a very specific reason. Uh, the state designed spatially you have a district administrator, you have a sub-district administrator, you have a police station which has a certain boundary. So, un so if you are able to geo-reference each of these data, it becomes so much more, more uh, easy to map the provider of the service with the, need, with the person who needs it. So I think it's really critical, and uh, I am so surprised that we are so delayed in this process. Yeah. I think this is the first thing that I would do, is geo-reference just about every, uh, uh, all of these uh, indicators. Absolutely, thank you. So now just going back to the MPI uh, for a few minutes, and particularly I wanted to ask Sabina, obviously the focus of this 
this festival is around the sustainable development goals in some, to some degree. How we use data and information in order to monitor the, the sustainable <coughs> challenge over the next 15 years. The MPI obviously doesn't cover all of the aspects of the SDGs, but it does cover a great many of them. What efforts are being made to try and sort of use the MPI as an SDG monitoring tool, and particularly where there are some dimensions it doesn't cover, so for example, environmental deprivation and, or environmental vulnerability. Is that something that you're thinking about and that the team at OFI have been looking into? Yes, um, very much so, though, again, we welcome um, joining of hands across disciplines and, and areas of expertise. But first of all, um, target 1.2 of the SDGs is, refers to poverty in all its dimensions. 1.1 is to end $1.90 a day poverty. So it is embedded there, mm -hmm. and there is an indicator around it which, um, of which co countries are custodians. And many countries in their voluntary national reviews or whatever um, at the high-level political forum uh, in their SDG reporting structures are reporting the, the national or the global MPI. At this moment, they can't put the data online, but that hopefully will be fixed soon. Um, but the, there are two or three strands of articulation of the kind you mentioned. First of all, for example, Gonzalo Hernández Licona, the head of Coneval in Mexico, which has a national multidimensional poverty measure, um, and co-founded this network of over 50 countries is saying that when countries design their MPI, they should think of it as a tool for prioritization in the SDGs. Mm -hmm. um, second, some countries, including Panama, including Chile, including others, have environmental indicators mm -hmm. in their MPI, whether it's um, distance to a river that overflows, whether it's pollution, insecurity, um, an experience shock. There are different ways actually of defining the environmental indicators that have happened. The key principle if the environmental indicators come into the MPI is that they have to refer to events that happened and touched people's lives in a, neg in a negative way in the same period that the other deprivation struck them. Yeah. So there's a subset of the SDG indicators, for example, around pollution or around um, uh, water and sanitation, th these kinds of things that can easily go into an MPI. Um, a number of the other SDG indicators that are environmental related are predicting future circumstances. Yep. So monitoring levels of carbon or whatever, deforestation, whatever. They may not directly touch those people in that time period. And so they shouldn't be put into an MPI, but actually should be spatially overlaid. So you see this population is dealing with a huge bulk of poverty, and at the same time to prevent future climactic changes, they also have an excess burden of adaptation. And so we can really visualize that. So I think there are different strategies. We're coming closer. Um, clearly the georeferencing is very important for merging satellite data with MPI data. Clearly there are problems of making displacement for anonymization, and we have to address those, yeah. um, but I think that at least conceptually we're clearer at ha what can go into an MPI and what basically can't and is still important, yeah. so needs to be treated in a different way. Thank you. The, the last thing to say on that, yeah. if I could, is just to mention that Colombia, which at 3 o'clock released its 2018 poverty figures, um, has chosen 16 cross-cutting indicators for the SDGs uh, goals and they've chosen the MPI as their cross-cutting poverty indicator. And so that's given it a kind of prominence. And so again, they're saying this in a sense collects a lot of our different SDG-related, poverty-related indicators and has this priority. Fabulous. Thank you, Sabina. I think that's really interesting as well because it adds a whole new dimension to the environmental vulnerability piece because it's also a measure of individual experiences with those environmental vulnerabilities, which isn't sort of captured in any one other indicator elsewhere in the framework. So that's, that's great. So, um, Shivani, uh, one of the themes that's coming out in this is all about leaving no one behind, so individuals. Um, and we've alluded to different ways of looking at individuals' time use, individuals' experience of deprivation, and so on. All this sort of um, raises for me the question of Many of the surveys we've been talking about are at the household level, but many of the problems we've been identifying are, are very individual. So do you think it's sort of about time that, you know, the, the UN or anyone else started thinking about an individual deprivation measure, looking really at the scale of the individual? Oh, yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, so, yeah, like you said, um, even the MPI and, you know, a lot of other measures, are at, they use household surveys, so this is uh, basically the unit of measure is the household. But as we know, um, intra-household uh, differences in dist and distribution also matter. So, 
you can be uh, a woman in the household and face your own specific kind of deprivations, for example, time poverty. Um, you can be a child in the household and uh, your uh, deprivations may be quite uh, distinct because you are at a particular uh, time in your life cycle when the deprivations have more of an impact than they do for the adults in the household. So, so yeah, it's really important to dig down deeper and look at um, deprivation and poverty at the individual level. There are some efforts uh, going on. Uh, I know my, one of my colleagues is working um, with UNICEF and you guys are also doing that, but looking at child multidimensional poverty. Mm -hmm. So uh, with, like looking inside the household and these particular deprivations that children face. There is also work going on to uh, look at um, the poverty issues faced by women and use the same household data that exists but somehow go to the level of the individual. It's not perfect because these uh, surveys are not designed to actually measure individual deprivations, but there is work going on and um, uh, yeah, uh, that's what I know about, uh, but yeah. Great, thank you so much. And the final question before we open it up to everyone else, for Eleanor. Um, Eleanor, there's a million things I'd like to ask you about the, the time use piece, but I think one question, a simple question I'd ask, or well, maybe not so simple, is um, you've talked about, you know, again, a really policy relevant, immediately useful um, set of information and a method for collecting it, um, understanding people's experiences of time, poverty and deprivation. Why are more countries not doing this? You know, why are there not more policymakers out there that are saying this is so fundamental to understanding the nature of our economy, everywhere should be doing it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that we did in our report was we looked really in depth at 18 country case studies, but we also have um, sort of a, a, a matrix where we look at all of the, the time use surveys that have been conducted um, over the last number of decades. Mm -hmm. um, and what we found was that 88 countries have uh, conducted some sort of time use um, survey. But generally what we find is that um, in most cases that um, the surveys are quite infrequent um, and that generally the, the data that's coming out of them is really underutilized. Mm -hmm. There's a number of methodological issues that, that countries kind of uh, are, are grappling with in order to, to th in thinking about time use. Um, and that's related to whether they do a kind of uh, a full-blown standalone time use survey, which can be, which can be time consuming um, for, for the, uh, the countries themselves and can also be expensive to implement. Mm -hmm. um, but there are also issues as well around whether um, that's necessarily the best way um, in every context. So there's no real one size fits all solution, um, particularly if you think about um, you know, how it's done in some countries is, is that you leave behind diaries at the house and people are asked to fill in what they're doing for, um, you know, in 10 minute segments uh, for 24 hours of a day. So it's, it's quite labor intensive for the respondents, yeah. but also in contexts where, um, for example, if literacy um, isn't widespread, then that can be quite difficult. So there are other ways to approach it that some countries um, have looked at. But I think th this issue about connection to policy is really the, the key issue that we that we found. And, and in that um, diagram that I showed, there, there's a number of mediating factors. So thinking about what is the political context, mm -hmm. um, who's really asking for the information. So in the in the countries where we found a really direct policy link, it was where. Um, other uh, ministries outside of the National Statistical Office had really mandated and asked for that information. Um, and in, uh, in some cases, were actually involved in um, funding the survey as well. So if there is that, that initial um, engagement between the data producers and the intended data users, you tend to see it getting used much, uh, much more. Um, so, so there are methodological issues as well as uh, demand, demand side issues as mm -hmm. well. Um, but it's, it, again, different in every context. Thank you. That's that's great, and well, and a considerable challenge, both the finances and the methodology. Um, I think we're going to take a few questions from the floor now. Um, I believe there are microphones available. Yes, there's a kind gentleman there with a microphone. Could, would you like to pass one to the gentleman on your right in red, and then there's a lady at the front here, and then a gentleman uh, in the middle there near the screen. Great. If you could just keep your hands up for a second so the gentleman can see. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, great. Hi, Please introduce hi. yourself. I'm David Gordon from the University of Bristol, and I, I have a question for Shivani. Thank you for a very interesting talk. You said that uh, you can use the, the UNDP MPI to uh, compare countries and also to uh, look at trends 
or changes over time. I just wondered if the UNDP had done any work to show that the measure is reliable and measurement invariant enough to make meaningful comparisons like that. Thank you. We're going to take the other two questions and then we'll come back to the panel. The lady at the front here, with her hand up. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Really, really interesting. Jackie Carter, University of Manchester. Hello, Dave. We've not met for a long time. So my question is, to what extent do you think 2D representation of what is incredibly complex, multidimensional, intersectional problems restricts understanding of the findings? And would one of the things that we could be doing is thinking about getting a bit more innovative with how we present this data to policymakers and other audiences? Great. I can see Sabina vigorously nodding her head, so I think she'll be responding to that one. And there's a gentleman at the back middle here. Yes, thank you. Hi. Um, my name is David Plummer. Um, my, my question really relates to uh, the unlocking the potential of the human, um, uh, which you relate, related to in the UNDP. And one of the things that the poverty index doesn't seem to pick up on uh, is what I would call emotional or spiritual poverty. And of course, the, the, I say of course, sorry, I believe that the key to unlocking potential is actually addressing that. Uh, because what we see um, in, in many other aspects of life, and, and health and fitness is a very good example, we can have all of the data, we can, ha we can lower the barrier to entry, we can make things accessible, people can have all of the information, mm -hmm. all of the resources to lead healthy, uh, full lives but most don't. In fact, the incidence of obesity uh, and diet-related uh, diseases goes up, has gone up, yep. both with wealth and with etc. So it's not, in, it, it's not enough to have the data. It's not enough to have... Mm -hmm. can, and, and this critical thing seems to be missing both from a measurement point of view, so I'd be very keen to hear what Sabine has to say on that, but also from a practice point of view. How, how are you in, in Panama... Uh, you know, have you seen this uh, as an issue? And if you have, how are you addressing it? Great. Just to make sure we can do one more quick round, I'm going to suggest that, um, Shivani, maybe you want to respond to the first question, and then perhaps, Sabina, the point about three-dimensional ways of thinking about this, and then the minister, the question that was just asked. And then we'll take a couple more for Eleanor and, and for Lavish. Great, thanks. Hi. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. So, like Sabina also mentioned, the global MPI is designed to be comparable across countries. But uh, yeah, definitely there's a trade-off between having a measure that is comparable across countries and something that can capture nat national issues. So uh, when only the global MPI existed, um, because it captures some very basic deprivations, I, a lot of, uh, say, middle-income countries felt that it didn't really capture things that were important to them, so maybe to them, Things like malnutrition may not be that important, but issues like obesity and mental health issues may be more important. But that's where the national MPIs come in because they can be tailored to the national context. And we also heard from the vice minister where you know they actually go to the people and ask them what issues matter to them. But basically, yeah, there is the global MPI that is comparable across countries. It serves a purpose. But there are, there are the national MPIs uh, that serve another purpose. And I would you like to add something to that? <laughs> Great. And maybe just one minute remarks each so we can take a few more questions. OK, I'll be brief. Um, on that, there are harmonized data um, with strictly harmonized definitions over time for the global MPI. On the 2D, 3D, absolutely. I mean, this is not our area of expertise, but this is what we're interested in this festival, really, is, is learning from people who are thinking and in, in, innovating about visualization. Because I think there's a lot more to do that us in Excel and our, you know, our backgrounds is just not going to permit us to go there. So I think, yes. Mm -hmm. um, just one question on, uh, on the emotional. So Bhutan's Gross National Happiness Index, which was most recently updated in 2015, published 2016, has a dimension of psychological well-being, which has positive and negative affect, satisfaction with quality of life, and uh, intensity of spiritual practice. And one of the insights that a group of Westerners received in going to Bhutan is that in that context, psychological well-being is understood to be a skill you can learn. It's, it's not that you are a victim of having a certain happiness condition, but it's a skill you can learn to be happy, like you can learn 
um, to ride a bicycle. So it's, it's an interesting context, and with that mentality, it becomes policy relevant in a way that it isn't in a country that thinks my subjective state is somebody else's uh, responsibility. So I think there's a lot of conversations to, to be had across cultural divides. It's fascinating. Yes, just to compliment. Is it this working? Yes. I think you brought up a, a, a very, very important issue, and in my particular case, I'm aware and I share your, your, your worry or your inquietude uh, behind that. Um, it's a challenge we have in Panama, and we don't have a way to measure it right now. We are following very closely what's happening in Bhutan, understanding that we have fundamental differences, as, as Sabina mentioned, but what we are doing, not to measure it, but at least to get closer, to consider it, is to get close to people, to develop policies with the participation of the communities and the families. In this uh, reduction uh, strategy uh, for poverty, what we do is that we have local social cabinets in the different provinces that we are working, and then those local social cabinets with the community develop a plan. And there you can take into account their priorities, their, their feelings, they, they have a space to give an opinion. And then we have like a sole promoter that goes at the home level, at the household level, and develop a family plan. And it's a very person-to-person -person work that, as I said at the beginning, we are not measuring it, but we are getting close to get into account what people care about in the solutions we're trying to provide or design through the different policies. But it's still a challenge to find a way to measure it and to be able to promote it in a more structured way. Thank you. Any final questions for um, Lavish or Eleanor? Yes, we have a gentleman here. Thank you. Um, Thank you all. Incredibly fascinating. Um, I am a, a newbie to this, so I may be making a category error or I may have missed something really obvious, so feel free to just dismiss this. But um, just looking through the, um, the measures uh, and taking a stroll around Wikipedia, something struck me, which is that I, I can't see any notion of connectivity, either in terms of internet or access to telecoms or mobile phones represented in the quality of life measures. And I was wondering if that's ever been contentious, because I know that um, there's a lot of hype around what access to mobile phones can do in terms of uh, engaging with local economy, um, getting a job, um, being able to transfer money, uh, having access to microfinance and things like that. So, yeah, again, big proviso. I may be completely missing the point, but I thought I'd ask. Great, and I think that that's a perfect question um, for Lavish. And then we have one more gentleman here with his hand up. Sir, do you have your hand up? No, maybe not. Okay, don't worry. So then I'm also just going to ask whether, um, Eleanor, maybe you want to reflect a little bit on the last question as well about kind of emotional experiences, given that time use and time deprivation is so closely linked to that. So, Lavish first? Yeah, so uh, we are actually in India uh, quite, uh, quite carefully trying to collect that data. And, but the biggest problem is that the mobile service providers do not share data on downtime, right, or poor quality of services. And uh, since the whole financial infrastructure for the poor is not built on the smartphone, it actually impacts things in a far uh, worse way than it otherwise would. So you're absolutely right, it is a big problem. And that's what my suggestion was, that you need the regulator to collect and share this data, otherwise it's never going to come in the public domain. Hello? Yeah, I think one of the um, interesting things about time use is the, the, the nuanced information that you can get from it and the, the kind of the different areas that are not generally covered by other household surveys and other data collection activities. Um, I, I, I can't necessarily think of an example where they've asked specific questions about um, emotional or kind of spiritual um, well-being, but there are definitely questions about um, well-being, um, about, uh, uh, you know, looking across... Um, different days of the week even, you know, how much time are people, are people spending on spiritual devotion, but I, I think as well putting, putting people in their context so that you can, you can think about 
what are all of the other demands on their time and really what's left at the end of that. So, um, you know, is there, is there time and space for them to, to, you know, have reflection time or, you know, to be thinking even about their own um, psychological well-being. Um, I, I might just say something about the mobile yes, um, the connectivity as well. Um, I, again, you know, um, as Lavish was saying, it's very difficult to, to collect data on, um, even mobile phone ownership can be very um, difficult because people may have multiple SIM cards or their um, phones are registered to, to a, a family plan member, and, but multiple people have phones. So that can be quite difficult. What you might be able to get from time use surveys is when people record, you know, sp spent, 20 minutes on the phone to, to, to my sister mm -hmm. or to my mother, et cetera. So you could at least have a measure of access to, to mobile phones, who actually has access rather than ownership. Um, but, but that you, know, you could kind of try to get at it that way. Great, we are over time, but I just wanted, I think the minister wanted to say a final quick remark, did he? Well, it was yes. close to, to that question and just something that came to my mind uh, regarding your question. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to finish answering you first. Uh, it's very curious that right now that we're working on the MPI for children, the emotional part came out very frequently. And we are facing the challenge on how to capture it. Because as we made consultations with people who live in poverty conditions, we are also making consultation with children. So this process is very funny, very interesting, but very moving as well. Because their priorities, when you ask, what the dimensions of poverty could be is being away from mom or not feeling secure or so there's a lot about emotions mm. and psychological well-being uh, behind this measurement that we are struggling with to to see how can we capture as much as possible of that of that aspect uh, that of course, is very important, but as, as Sabina said, the MPI is not the panacea, it's not the absolute answer or the absolute instrument for capturing poverty. It's, it's a, a, an amazing instrument, but it's important to identify which areas are not included there to start developing or to continue developing other tools to uh, approach it. And regarding the internet and the mobiles, in the Panamanian MPI, we introduced, uh, as a dimension, the access to internet. For the reason you, you, you already described, that is, the connection to the world, the connection to opportunities. And this is probably the indicator that we were able to move the most uh, from past year to this year, mm -hmm. because it was very easy when you had, like, this focalization of the territories where the multidimensional poverty is, is, is higher. And then you know that they're, they're lacking a connect, connectivity, internet connectivity. It was very easy with the authority in charge of that to coordinate actions and to give access to internet to, to those, those territories. And we are now working with some mobile companies to develop some strategies for training and capacity development uh, for productive inclusion thanks to, to that advance. So it's a very important point and, and I think uh, in a very short term we're seeing results of introducing it as part of the dimensions we're considering. Great, thank you so much. And um, that was a fabulous panel, so if you could all just raise your hand. Um, thank you. Thank you to all of our speakers. I would be remiss if I didn't say two final things. One is that I work for SDSN, and this month is Global Happiness Month. We just released our annual Global Happiness Report, so I'd encourage you to go to SDSN's website and have a look at that. And I also just wanted to say a huge thanks to the organizers of this session, particularly Malika Edquist, who's just standing over there in the red jacket, and uh, to everyone from the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. So thank you, and thank you to our wonderful panelists.